Fantastic. Thanks, Natalia, for the introduction and the invitation to speak today. I apologise to everyone on the call for the quality of my voice. I'm recovering from the flu. Um, so, uh, Natalia just included a, a welcome to country. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome any First Nations people attending the call today. For those of you who aren't familiar with NCI, we did just go through the acronym, um, we provide high performance computing and associated data services to over five and a half thousand researchers. So the vocabulary work that I'll be covering today was undertaken as part of a collaborative 2030 geophysics collections project that involved NCI as well as Ausscope, TURN and ARDC. So the, the project brought together this huge quantity of data um, uh, with the aim to make it more fair and integrated and, and set up and optimised for analysis on the supercomputer here at NCI. So on the other side of the globe, there's a group of international geophysicists led by Jared Peacock who developed this sort of MT metadata standard. Magnetolyrics is a geophysical technique that involves measurement of the Earth's magnetic and electric fields. So the MT metadata standard is, is formally published in a journal article that has a DOI. There's also a GitHub repository with its associated Zenodo record and another DOI. And there's a Read the Docs documentation website. But when we were looking at um, documenting um, some of these geophysics data sets according to the MT metadata standard, um, there were no sort of URIs for the specific attributes and, um, and uh, controlled vocabularies. So as we know, um, the second interoperable principle requires that metadata use vocabularies that follow FAIR principles. Yet many of these vocabularies are not available online, and if they are, they're published as you know static PDFs and things. So um, we really wanted something that was version controlled and had links to those specific um, terms. Um, in the case of the the geophysics collections, um, we had a particular use case that we were trying to address, and that was documenting a profile of the MT metadata standard, because some of the data sets we were working with are legacy data sets. They didn't have all of the information available, but we were trying to document exactly what was captured and what wasn't possible. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was machine readable. Um, so I've always loved this quote. <laughs> Too often we're focusing on the like here and now and digital preservation in the longer term isn't really um, uh, front of mind. So for various reasons, we were reluctant to try and publish the MT metadata um, profile of vocabulary on NCI's website. We don't have um, a vocabulary server. We haven't historically published vocabularies. We didn't actually put together this vocabulary either. We're just trying to document the profile. So all of these reasons, um, as well as the fact that the MT metadata standard is continuing to evolve with new versions being developed, we were keen to make sure that we had a solution that would allow international collaborators or domain experts to update or maintain the resource in future. Um, so that's where W3IT um, came to the fore. Um, so I was going to do a show of hands of who was aware of um, W3IT or whether they'd used it before, but I'm not sure I can see everyone. So anyway, we'll <laughs> be interested to hear in the questions. Um, so from our point of view, W3IT was attractive as a secure sort of permanent redirection service. We could set up a new domain, like a new web address for the MT metadata profile and then create persistent links back to Research Vocabularies Australia, RVA. Um, so how does it work? Um, this is in demo and this was a trial um, sort of set up and it's set up in demo only at this stage. So uh, this is the landing page in RVA demo for the um, Oscope Auslan profile of the MT metadata standard. Um, and you can see this bit of descriptive information and, and so forth. Uh, if you go down the page and you look at the specific vocabulary terms, you can see that each of them has an IRI there. So, um, and you can see that it uses the W3ID domain. Um, so each concept in RVI demo has been assigned a W3ID URI. Clicking on the URI, uh, the W3 
um, ID URI redirects you to the concept URI landing page on RVA demo, so you can um, see all the detailed um, uh, information there. So for clarity, here's an example. You can see that any W3ID URLs for empty metadata are automatically redirected to the corresponding page on RVA demo. So how did, how did we actually do this? What was the implementation steps? Um, so there's detailed guidance on how to create a new identifier on the W3ID website. Um, the first step was to check that the domain that we actually that we wanted was available, uh, which it was. The next step was to fork the W3ID GitHub repository. If you haven't used GitHub before, there's guides and training for this elsewhere. Basically, I kind of made my own copy of the W3ID code so that I could edit it to add the MT metadata domain. Uh, the next step was to open the code in GitHub Desktop and then my Atom editor. I then added a new folder for MT metadata and then created two files, so the README and the HT access file. Uh, the README is obviously just the basic information about what the domain is used for and contact information and so forth. Um, the, the other file specifies how the redirections should be applied. Uh, it includes the pattern to match and how to convert the URLs. So if you want to redirect to RVA, I recommend you, you could try using my file as a template. Um, so, uh, but you could set it up to redirect as you as you prefer. Um, I'm not a sysadmin, <laughs> um, but I've managed to sort of figure out the Apache redirects um, enough to to get it working. It did take a couple of tests and um, uh, to get it to get it um, redirecting as expected. So. Once I completed and tested my changes, I merged it back to the master via, via a pull request. Um, and then to return to that previous slide, the way that I set it up was you can see at the very end of that URL, the top one, it's there's a, um, a number 100, um, and that's uh, for the specific term. And then you can see once the redirection applies, it still goes to the specific page um, uh, for that specific term. So. Um, in order to use the W3ID domain, uh, the next step was to export the vocabulary from pool party and RDF format, use find replace to fix all the URIs to use the W3ID domain, and then re-upload the RDF into pool party. This was actually a bit chunky. Um, RDF format was a bit lossy and some of the features that we were trying to use, like lists, weren't preserved when we re-imported. So um, I recommend testing that as a new vocabulary before, like using the overwrite <laughs> function. Um, and to get make sure that it's it's um, all correct. So some decisions that we had to to make included like what top level domain to use. It had to be something short. It had to be something unique. And and um, we were conscious that any new versions published now there, there's new versions of um, NT metadata, but there might be other profiles or other things that would want to be included in future. So we didn't go. We added a couple of like extra levels in the hierarchy to sort of future proof, well, a, a little attempt to future proof so that there's scope to kind of um, add more um, uh, vocabularies in future. So each concept in RVA was um, assigned an incremental number. We wanted to avoid using the concept names because there's the risk that they could change. Um, incremental numbers. Yeah, they seemed okay because this is a relatively simple use case. Um, so, I guess um, yeah, that's that's basically what I wanted to cover today. Um, W3ID um, seemed like a useful way to redirect um, uh, to manage those redirections, uh, and it wasn't overly complicated to set up. Uh, and I really want to put in a plug and a thank you to to Rowan for his um, support and and uh, help getting it all up and running. So, hi, I'm Valerie Dixon. Um, I'm NASA uh, Earth Science Information and Data System Project uh, representative here to talk about GCMD keywords. A um, little bit of a history <laughs> and past, present, and future lesson here. So way back, back in the 1990s. Um, the, uh, the Landsat missions from the 70s and 80s were fueling a growing demand for controlled vocabulary for a single common repository of 
Earth observation metadata and keywords and you know just a need to get organized. And around the same time, uh, NASA became involved in the International Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, the CS organization, um, which is a collection of different um, agencies from around the world who make Earth observations. And as part of our uh, contributions to CS, uh, GCMD, by way of uh, the International Directory Network, the IDN, uh, became NASA's contribution to the CS uh, collective. Um, <laughs> there was there was another um, while this GCMD catalog uh, for Earth, NASA's Earth Science data was growing. Uh, GCMD was growing alongside a sister project, the Earth Observing uh, System Data and Information System (EOSDIS), um, which it was conceived as a, an architecture to um, archive long-term and disseminate Earth observation and Earth Science data. Now these two are very much parallel, very overlapping projects, and it took a good 20 years for the two projects to be officially merged with one another within the Earth Science Data and Information System project. Um, although the technologies uh, backing the two of them had been aligning more and more over the years uh, before then. So by the time the official merger took place, almost all of the back end architecture and uh, tooling was was shared at that point. Um, this is just to to give a little bit of history that GCMD um, it had been at one point a much broader concept than what it currently is. Um, you know, it had been a repository. It had been the whole the whole kit and caboodle of of data. Um, and through all the consolidation and renaming of tools and merging of tools and applications, um, the GCMD's keywords. Uh, which is a hierarchical controlled vocabulary. It describes Earth science data services variables and, and a lot more. Um, that has remained intact and, and it was not <laughs> being replicated in the other project. So, so it is its own thing still. Um, so GCMD keywords, they are essential to the search and discovery within our entire project and all of our tools and services. Um, oops, so to the present, um, they are ever evolving, the GCMD keywords. Um, it suits to suit the needs of our, our EO, broader EOS community, our, our consumers and, and providers. Um, and there are quite a few tools that we have um, since uh, built and developed and evolved to take better advantage of and, and uh, you know, better use the GCMD keywords. We have a, uh, the GCMD keyword viewer. It's our, our GUI interface where you can actually uh, browse through the different hierarchies, the different branches of our vocabularies. Um, we have the keyword management management system KMS, which is a RESTful API um, that you can programmatically use to to query keywords uh, in the KMS. Uh, it enables um, access to uh, SCOS objects as well as uh, the static KMS directory, which you can download in a variety of different formats. And we have a, a user's guide that walks through how to use that pretty well. Um, we also have now a GCMD keyword forum as a distinct part within the Earth Data Forum. Um, this is an online forum. It provides uh, the keyword users and, and uh, consumers uh, a place to come to talk about keywords, you know, best practices, suggestions uh, for, hey, can I add this? Can we change that? Uh, what would be the ramifications if we change this whole thing? <laughs> as, as well as to come and get alerted to uh, new uh, releases and updates to the key keywords themselves. Um, so just an overview of the different tools. Our keyword viewer here, um, while the Earth Science keyword category is by far and large the most commonly used and commonly referenced part of the GCMD keywords. We also have quite a few other categories of keywords here and controlled vocabularies. Um, but science keywords, that's where the rubber meets the road for most folks. Uh, if you can dig down to the, to the uh, different subcategories, um, you can eventually get down to uh, distinct entities. And, and as you click through this in the GCMD keyword viewer, uh, you will see definitions for each of them. Uh, pop up as well. Um, this provides just an easy to navigate interface, a human navigable interface that can allow users to actually view and explore these different categories at length. Um, the KMS RESTful API, uh, this allows navigation through the URL itself. Um, this is predominantly where people use uh, coding to script access to keywords. Um, you can see here a list of different, you know, Git concepts, um, you know, parameters and 
and actions commands here. Um, the static directory, this just enables the download of the different categories of our keywords as either an RDF, a JSON, XML, or a CSV file if you want to have a copy of it for other reference or offline reference. Um, the user's guide as referenced uh, walks you through the use of the API as well as the static uh, directory uh, best practices from the examples. The uh, GCMB keyword forum, and I will provide these slides after the presentation. They have all of these hyperlinks in them, <laughs> so you don't have to worry about taking notes now. Um, so the, the, the keyword forum, um, as I said, is, is where you know scientists, uh, the metadata curator community, provider community, um, academics, they can come and discuss science keywords um, that they may use from GCMD for different purposes. Um, they can discuss whether whether or not to make additions, the impacts of those additions. They have, can also use the, the forum to request changes to the keywords. So this is our front door for um, new keyword requests. If people want to add or modify um, what's there, um, bring it to the keyword forum. Um, it'll get to us. Uh, the community is pretty active about the areas that they care about, so people will will pay attention and, and chime in if if they have opinions about it. <laughs> um, otherwise, uh, we we generally, if it's a, not a, a terribly impactful request, uh, we can make releases to the keywords um, as often as every every other week, um, depending on content. Um, so how we use the GCMD keywords within EOSDIS, the broader community here in NASA. Um, having a consistent vocabulary is absolutely crucial to enabling programmatic search and discovery as well as uh, compatibility across our different tools and services. Uh, we have um, the Common Metadata Repository, CMR, uh, and Earth Data Search. Those are the bread and butter of our project. That's where we house all of our metadata and, and surface it, respectively. Um, and they rely extremely heavily on the controlled vocabularies of the GCMD keywords in order to just work, period. Um, Changes and additions that come in through the forum. Um, as I mentioned, uh, smaller changes we can just push through in a couple of weeks, but if there are uh, bigger changes or requests that have broader impact to across different communities, you know, such as reorganizing a new branch of vocabularies, um, we will put those requests through the, uh, the ESDA Standards Coordination Office. That's called ESCO. It's a community review. Um, where largely we, we reach out not just to, to NASA, but to interested parties that we know of <laughs> through through largely the forum as points of contact to say, hey, you know, we noticed that you were interested in this topic before. Is this going to hurt you if we change like this? Um, and so we try to get those community reviews before we make any changes that could upset folks. Um, we've also been using GCMD keywords in NASA to contribute to some of our machine learning tooling. Um, so we have what's called a GCMD Keyword Recommender, the GKR. Uh, it is embedded within our metadata management tool, uh, and it is being used to drastically reduce the workload for our metadata curators. It suggests uh, science keywords to add to their collection metadata records um, so that we can better key off of them for search and discovery. Sometimes that can be really onerous if a particular data set has a lot of different potential applications. Um, so the GKR um, has some ML magic black box <laughs> behind the scenes that, that is taking a look at some of the other content that has been entered into the metadata record and suggests potentially relevant science keywords that the curator can then select to keep or, or reject. Um, let's see. Uh, we have also, uh, in, in the realm of machine learning, uh, recently introduced a new science services keywords. The science services is a category within GCMD keywords. Uh, and we've we've introduced some new keywords to describe uh, machine learning training and model data as a controlled vocabulary. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty young still. So if there is feedback <laughs> to, to what exists there, we are more than welcome to, to take uh, suggestions as well. Um, We've had a quite a quite a bit of history with interagency collaborations here on the U.S. side. Um, 
with our sister agencies, uh, NOAA and USGS. Uh, they forked uh, copies of GCMD keywords many years back and developed them independently. And so we spent a few years trying to merge those independent um, evolutions back together again. Um, we did get through the atmosphere and oceans keywords between our agencies. We reconciled all of those in versions 10 and 12 of GCMD releases. Uh, currently, we're on version 18.6 for reference. Um, we were in the process of getting started with the Sun Earth interactions and then the pandemic hit um, and it threw a wrench into that works. Uh, unfortunately, since the pandemic has cooled off, um, a lot of people have moved on, priorities have shifted, and this effort is it's it's sitting on a shelf waiting to be picked up again. But <laughs> but we hope to get back there and, and resolve our agency's uh, keywords in the near future. Um, Let's see, we also, I mentioned uh, CIOS, the international um, collaboration that we are part of. Uh, our partner agencies use a lot of GCMD keywords in their Earth observation collection metadata, um, which is housed in our common metadata repository and made discoverable via the IDN. Um, the, uh, the IDN was mentioned well in the past as being part of um, our commitment to CIOS. Uh, it is it is now currently a search portal of our Earth data search client, um, and it makes all of the NASA and CIOS data partner um, metadata or, or collection records discoverable, pretty much all the content of CMR. Um, just a quick run through of Earth data search and how our search client uses uh, GCMD keywords. You can see here um, there's a left panel of a bunch of different uh, facets and filters, and you can see here there's a keyword. And if you expand that down, these are all the same categories that you find in the science keywords in GCMD. Um, not all the, the uh, top level categories, but all of the uh, science keyword categories. Um, and so you can drill down to those and say, OK, well, um, you could filter all the way down to the same hierarchy that exists in that you can find in the GCMD keyword viewer and say, OK, well, for atmospheric phenomenon, there were three data sets here, two modus files and a, and a vegetation index that had uh, drought and storms, atmospheric phenomena, key science keywords associated with them. Um, and you can drill down through the keywords this way also to help filter the, uh, <laughs> the many, many data holdings that we have in, in CMR. Um, just to touch again on the, the GKR a little bit, um, this is a screenshot of our metadata management tool and the GKR is sort of embedded within it. And you can see here, um, you know, it's taking a look at like the abstract of the metadata. For example, this record had a test file for water vapor and humidity in tropical jungles as its abstract for that, that metadata record. And the GKR suggested, you know, the following science keywords as possibly relevant. And you can see some of them look more relevant than others. It's, I'm not sure that upper level wins necessarily is pertinent, but there are many other <laughs> that, that seem kind of on. And, and so this is a, a learning, <laughs> an ongoing learning experiment of, of trying to use machine learning to, to make our curators' lives a little easier. Um, so GCMD tomorrow, what we hope to do with this, we have long hoped for many years to turn GCMD keywords from a hierarchical keyword set into a, a honest to goodness semantic ontology. But how, <laughs> when, and with what resources has been the conundrum that we keep getting blocked at one or all of those. Um, there is the uh, Earth Science Information Partners, ESIP. It's a, um, a conference here in the US that has put together a project called the Semantic Web for Earth and Environmental Terminology, SWEET, um, where they actually, they forked off GCMD some years ago and a few folks on their free time best effort as a passion project started turning it into a semantic ontology. They didn't finish, <laughs> they got part way through. It kind of petered out, you know, some of them retired, some of them got reassigned to other projects. Um, we're not sure if we need to pump new life into into Sweet, um, but we do have a upcoming uh, ESIP conference uh, next month, mid July, where we hope to talk about this with the ESIP partners and say, "Hey, <laughs> where did we leave off? Is there any interest? Can we get can we get momentum going on this again?" Um, there's also a possibility of uh, approaching GCMD as a knowledge graph. Um, 
we currently use GraphQL and GraphDB uh, for metadata associations, making linkages between concepts within our, our metadata repository. Um, so it's not that much of a stretch to think of, OK, well, how could we do keywords as a knowledge graph? But we don't really have the, the expertise or the priority to, to really, really do a, a, a full overhaul of GCMD keywords as a knowledge graph currently. Um, but it's it's started. The, the proof of concept is there. Um, it's an idea anyway that we could pursue as well. Um, but in the meantime, that we still have some low hanging fruit that we really should get on, uh, which is just creating unique identifiers for each of the keywords and GCMD keywords. Um, you know, as as capitalizations change, as spellings change, as as tweaks and modifications occur, um, that can mess up people's metadata records if they have just text for the keywords as opposed to an identifier that says, hey, it's it's really the same thing. We just, you know, clarified it a little. Um, so adding unique identifiers and citing those in our metadata records is, I think, the next um, realistic step that we, we can expect to be taking in the next year or so um, while we figure out how to make GCMD a real semantic ontology for real, we hope. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, apologies if this is a very high level overview, um, but please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, anytime, I will try to get back to you <laughs> much more responsive manner than I have been. Um, any other questions? I think we're going on to the questions now. <laughs>